Hello, and welcome to Once More with Feeling. We're your hosts, Edmund Scrimmins, and... Yes, because I'm always here. Please, I can't leave. I'm getting to cross here. Please help me. Help me. Ah, you made your own bed, now you've got to lie in it. The bed is unmade, I'm looking on it right now. <laughs> then again, you're normally lying in the same bed with Richard. I mean nothing. It's only happened a couple of times, thank you very much. <laughs> It was a string of circumstances. Like not having, well, more, less not having enough money and more just not wanting to spend money for the sake of having to stay one bed in some guy's bed. Yeah. Do you remember you were the one that called in bed with me once? How, haven't we pretty much all done that? I guess we were at some point. That's just what we're like. Yeah. And the audience is getting a very weird insight right now. God damn, we're gay as fuck. <laughs> Surprisingly not. Kind of ironic, really. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, this episode, as previously advertised, we're going to be talking about the new Draconian album, Sovereign, which is actually a corruption of Sovereign. It, there's no translation. It, sovereign, Sovereign. It literally means that. Um, you can't really argue with that, because it makes sense. Yeah. Um, of course, we're going to be starting with what we've been recently listening to. That's my usual. Yeah. So, yeah, what have you been listening to? Whatever the hell I can get my hands on, really. It's kind of weird. I mean, I've looked at my last FM for the last, like, month or so. Mm-hmm. It's been filled with a lot of soundtrack stuff, a whole ton of RRE, and a bunch of Denver Gimme, and then some Quack Shadows. Who's no J pop and Dark Wave go together so well? <laughs> yeah, a bit of a disconnect there. Unless you're talking about things like Versailles and... Well, you know, things like Kiko Shikata, which is pretty much a combination of dark wave, jeep and folk. That sounds like a very peculiar... (laughs) She's pretty great. I've just been finding all manner of things sort of just littered around my library, sort of like earlier listening to a Man of War... Man of War, even. (laughs) Something that I'd never heard before, and it's sort of like... This is pretty awesome. What is it? Oh, Man of War. How did this get here? <laughs> the end. <laughs> um, also listening to Sabaton because going to be seeing them in a few months. So, so. Good old Sabaton. There's someone I know I reckon a band I would like to see because they just sound incredibly fun. Oh, they are. They're, they're a lot of fun. It's just their shows get very silly and absurd which kind of makes sense considering well actually it's kind of a juxtaposition with the subject matter of their songs um for anyone who doesn't know what sabaton are like 98 percent of their songs are about various wars or battles or panzer divisions or anything like that the other two percent is metal songs about metal (laughs) Yep, that sounds like a pretty regular thing when it comes to metal. So what's more metal to sing about than metal? Yeah, but I mean, one of their songs features the line, Is this Saint Anger the ultimate sin? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that is brutal. <laughs> well, it's one of those bit-on-the-nose lines. But hey, everyone knows Saint Anger is a joke. Oh, it's Especially quite... us, which is what we joke about all the time. Like now. Yeah. Or... <laughs> That has to be a record for us, four minutes in, and we're already bitching about St. Anger again. (laughs) That's quite an easy thing to bitch about. Yeah, especially when you consider conspiracy theories that could be formulated around it. Like... Basically, it was aliens. (laughs) No, seriously. Consider this. The legal court cases against Napster came about during the run-up to Saint Anger being released. I just, I just believe it was Lars. It was probably Lars. Well, yeah, because he was the one most rabidly pursuing Napster. That's because he's vehemently against anything. It makes him have less money than he wants. Yeah. But I was thinking of something recently. It's like, oh, here's a quiz. Are you a true Metallica fan? First question was just, do you hate Lars? <laughs> It's one of yeah, well. It's one of those um how do you answer that? Are you a true Metallica fan because you do or because you don't? 
Really? I mean, in the case of... It's probably if you do. Because most Metallica fans don't like Lars. Yeah. Because he's kind of a dick. Kind of a dick? <laughs> I think there's a reason he looks like Gollum. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Oh, he's a wasted shell of his old self. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess it's <laughs> <laughs> Although, like a Dutch Gollum. The tyranny of the Dutch. It is nice to imagine Lars as making clogs. I don't know, and it's probably pretty stereotypical, he might not like that. Hmm. We're sue us with this. So if he gets sued, uh, we, we, we probably won't hear after him. Once again. We'd have to get famous overnight for him to want to sue us. I don't know. If we can get money. It's like, hmm, these people no one's ever heard of are talking badly about me. Better sue the fuck out of me. It's more dosh for me. It'd end up costing him more in legal fees than he'd get. <laughs> That's what we call the judges, you see. Hmm? It's probably his entire like life is just judging if he can make more money from suing people than if he loses it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough of that bitching. We have to bitch sometimes. That happens every episode. Yeah. They'll be used to it by now. <laughs> Whoever they are. Yeah. Aliens. Well, we know we've got at least a few regular listeners. I mean, this is true. I think pretty much. All bar one of the episodes has at least eleven views, so. So hopefully you have people that actually do regularly listen to us. I'm not entirely sure why, but hey, it's good for you. Yeah. We appreciate you. But no, we're also worried about your sanity. But yeah. <laughs> Let's face it, we wouldn't be doing this if we were entirely sane, would we? Indeed, the rabbit's still with you. <laughs> I mean, even if I do get enough views to make it worth monetizing this, how would we even sort out the split of money? I don't know. And, you know, we do this for fun anyway, so... Yeah. It looks like it costs us anything to do this other than time. Yeah. And, let's face it, I've not got work and this actually will give me a better chance of getting into work. And so, yeah. And this might actually give you a better chance of getting out of the shitty job that you've got. This is true. I mean, just getting out of retail in general would be lovely. Yeah. I think you know that pretty well, the retail is kind of bad. Yep. Although it could be worse, you could be working in a theme park. This is true. Or more specific. We still get plenty of repetitive shitty music over and over again, though. Hmm. Or to be more specific, you could be working catering in a theme park. Yeah, that doesn't sound pleasant at all. No, it isn't. Especially as there's so many times where you just want to strangle the customer. We get that as well. Mm. I think everyone gets that. If you're yeah. working with customers, you're probably going to want to strangle them. So yeah. things work. Yeah, but there's a difference between a few dozen customers every day and a few hundred customers every day. <laughs> well, you want to strangle or just in general? Just in general. Because <laughs> I don't know, we, we serve generally a few thousand a day, so. Not yeah. exactly light levels. Yeah, but I'm talking individually. True. Good major point. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, back to various things been listening to. I think basically what ends up happening is I just click on play and see what happens. Well, that does happen. I mean, I generally kind of school through my library and I think, this is something I haven't heard in a while, listen to that. Mm. What that happens to be, uh, who knows, it's whatever I feel like at the time. Yeah. I mean, one, one song that's really quite cool and creepy and everything, of course, it's a German industrial metal song, so it would be quite creepy. Um, that's not a slam against the Germans, I'm just saying that typically your industrial music is quite creepy. Unless it's D. Krupps, which is kind of an exception that proves the rule. <laughs> Although if you've listened to Robo Sapien, that's quite... That's creepy, but for a different reason. But anyway, uh, Lycanthropy by ASP or ASP, or I don't know how it's meant to be said. I don't, I don't know if it's an acronym for something or whether they just like shouting their name because <laughs> it's yeah. all capitals. So I don't know. Well, this always reminds me of that one Marin Kurosaki song. Where literally, it's just called screaming, shouting loudly. <laughs> Why? Why is that title? I like it. Why? Yeah, you come across weird songs like that all of the time, and you're just sort of like, what is with that? I don't get it. <laughs> I don't know what people the media are thinking, but I like their way of thinking. Yeah. Um, 
Oh yeah, uh, of course, uh, last month there was City... Was it last month? I don't know, um, I don't know what you're talking about, because you haven't mentioned what you're talking about. Uh, the same week as um, Silent Hill Live. Oh, um... I think I remember that. Must have been first week in November, I think? Yeah, it was. Um, so, yeah, seeing um, Killing Joke Live, yeah, that was pretty mental. I can imagine. Well... I've been to a lot of gigs where, you know, you're in the front few rows and it gets kind of a clusterfuck. <laughs> they have nothing on killing joke crowds. My God. I, 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 I dis I'm pretty sure that I displaced my spleen during that crowd. <laughs> and half my liver. <laughs> and both my kidneys. I'm currently talking to you through burping. <laughs> oh god, I took my vocal cords. What? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it was quite mental. and They actually played most of the songs that got me into them. Bar like, I thought it was good. Bar like one or two. So it was good to have a bunch of songs like that. It's like, oh, I really like this song. Yay. Uh, anyway, shall we get on to the album? That's probably a good idea, because that's kind of what we're here for. <laughs> and we've already talking for about 15 minutes. Well, what were you talking? Christopher talking? Ay. It's going to be one of those evenings, is it? It's always one of those evenings. Fair point. It's unbearable. Oh, God, the bears. Not the bears! Not the bears! <laughs> oh, God, I'm just thinking to that one evening where we were in the lodge and we just coming out with bear pun after bear pun that was the best day of my entire life better than seeing Calafina live in Japan that's pretty good too but there's something that just doesn't hold it to bear puns just bear pun overload I mean I suppose some people can be quite polarizing but hey <laughs> anyway so <laughs> Sovran how can I make a bear pun out of that hmm, hmm? it's really hard to make a bear pun out of it I can't think of one, so... No, you can't. You just can't. Don't try. Don't force the puns. So, the first thing that struck me about this album... I mean, I'm not... I, I've heard a few Draconian songs before, but I'm not that familiar with them in terms of full-length albums. Uh, the first thing that struck me about it is it felt very concept album-y. It's kind of hard to explain how that works. Hmm... The concept albums are odd, and they kind of vary depending on which band it is, so who the bloody knows. I mean, I'm not sure, I'm, I wouldn't like to say whether or not it was intended that this was a concept album, it's just that it certainly felt to me like it is. I thought anyone who really knows that is the band itself. Yeah. As far as I know, they haven't released any information about that kind of structure, but I will be wrong. Mm. Well, I haven't been able to... I, looked up the album to see if I could find any information. I could only really find the lyrics and the bare bones, you know. <laughs> I don't get it. Bear. <laughs> That's what I think of a bear pun. <laughs> uh, it's just as well we only do this every few, every once in a while, otherwise I might have to fire you. <laughs> Knowing you, you'd probably fire me out of a cannon. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, I've only been able to find sort of like details like what number album of theirs it is and things like that. Pretty regular stuff, then, really. Yeah, you know, personnel, that sort of thing. Regular background information you get from any release, really. Yeah. So presumably they would have. I mean, it's kind of their band. I reckon would mention if it was concept to. Hmm. So it probably isn't. Yeah. Although the first two songs for me. They do actually feel like they're one song, but in chapters. I can kind of see what you're getting at there. The first two songs do kind of kind of follow on from each other. Mm. And some of the later ones do seem to have kind of progression to them as well. Yeah. So maybe there is a concept album, or just has a kind of concept structure to it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, let's see. The title of the album, Sovereign, which does mean ruler, king, whatever. And the opening track is Heavy Lies the Crown. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Kind of follows that kind of theme again. Mm. 
Well, there's some of the other songs, I mean, like The Marriage of Ataris, for example, that song title sounds like it could be something to do with the kind of monarchy as well. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I love that song. I mean, let's see. You've got the opening tracks of Heavy Lies the Crown and The Wretched Tide. Um, now, Heavy Lies the Crown has a very creeping feeling to its opening. It's kind of. It's only a kind of. Quite a bit different to the, original, the rest of the album, I'd say. Mm. It, as I said, well, I was mentioning to you earlier, it reminds me quite a lot of earlier kind of My Dying Bride. Yeah. I mean, that opening guitar work, I don't know what song it is, it reminds me of. I think it's something off of Dreadful Hours. Mm-hmm. Not that old, actually, but only about a decade old. Mm. It's not a super early My Dying Bride. But also the um, kind of synthetic organ throughout, who was a kind of reminds me a lot once again of My Dying Bride. Mm. I mean, it kind of reminds me a bit of um, very early Paradise Lost. Oh, but yeah, there's uh, a difference between my and Bright Paradise Lost and uh, Anathema. They kind of covered most of the areas, like Catatonia as well. Yeah. They're kind of the main kind of doom bands around the, that era. Yeah. Opinion came a little bit later, but since they're taking up similar kind of structures to that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's very effective. It's all, the feel of it. It's it's one of those when you've got a title like that you need to have weight to the song and this song really has a very bombastic heavy weight to it mm. also, I think the organ kind of sound adds to that as well yeah it's kind of fun- funereal I guess yeah in a way it's uh, a good word I like the word funereal mm. well, it's kind of interesting that I suppose cause every other album so far has had Lisa Gohans I think it is on, vocal, on female vocals, but she left after the last album. Mm-hmm. So I suppose that this album, they're probably going to introduce the new singer as the first vocalist on the entire album. It's quite a bold move. Mm-hmm. And Hickey, the you know, singer, it's actually, I really like her voice. Kind of a little bit of um, Sharon and Edel from Within Detection. I know, can hear that. Darker. Mm. Uh, I'd say her voice is a little bit stronger than Sharon Denadel's. Oh, uh, yeah, I'd say so. I was, I was wondering about it quite a lot originally because. The uh, Lisa, the original vocalist, I absolutely adore her vocals. So I was thinking, are they going to make the top part? Mm. I think they did a pretty good job of finding a worthwhile replacement here. Yeah, I think that's the thing with a lot of bands. When they have to replace vocalists, they should be more thinking, can we be as good, not mm. can we top the previous one? Because when bands think along those lines, it feels like there's a very bitter attitude to it. Mm. Oh, we are you doing better? Mm. In this case, it's kind of like, oh, okay, we've lost what we had. We need to find something that can, you know, be a, a worthy replacement. It doesn't necessarily drop stage them at all, but as long as it covers the same kind of feel, it has the same kind of effect. Yeah. Um, it's always the slowest song in the album because the speed, the speed of the song is quite a bit slower than a lot of other things in the album as well. Yeah, it's. Which kind of always been one of those bands that you know, takes the kind of slow, kind of heavy marching feel of Doom, but also had much faster passages as well. Mm. And I think they managed to do a pretty good job of that here. Um, I'm just having a look through the lyrics. I decided to get all of the lyrics up in preparation so people wouldn't have to hear me tapping away constantly. <laughs> um, choice verses like uh, in um, Heavy Lies the Crown, like um, Fallen from Luster to Nothingness and Scorn, and Fall Dark Veils Softly Through the Morn. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very much like Draconian writing to me. Mm. Uh, I kind of get the feeling from this song of the whole point of Heavy Lies the Crown is the idea of the difficulties that a ruler might face who's trying to be a good ruler. Mm, because it's just a concept there is that, you know, the king has a crown, he has a, has a responsibility of being a, a more like a leader. Mm. And, you know, he's also got to deal with all the problems of it. Anything that goes wrong is going to be under his word, his yeah. name. He's going to be the one responsible for everything. Yeah, and I think that's also why you have a bit of a funereal vibe to it, because I kind of get the idea that it might be a ruler who's facing his last days and looking back on what's going on. Maybe. So without an actual solid idea of what the concept is, it's just, it's just it kind of, there's some bands kind of do that, they're going to give you a concept and think, oh, well, we're not actually going to tell you what the concept is. Is, but we're going to let you just think it over for yourselves and everyone can make their own opinion. Mm. Which I like them better, they don't try and force their concept down your throat. Yeah. They're like, oh, if you want to, there you go, here's other stuff, if you want to make, make what you want of it, go ahead. Yeah. We're not going to stop you. As opposed to certain bands who it's just, you will understand what we're trying to get at if we, <laughs> as we beat you over the head with the concept. Pink Floyd! I'm <laughs> sorry, did I sneeze? I said Pink Floyd. 
and I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for that, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of weird, that's where some artists like, say, Cahoot and Cambria or Dream Theater do it as well sometimes. Yeah, I mean... I quite like both of them, in some cases. Turn on the album, really. Yeah. Everyone. But in some cases, they do tend to get a bit heavy-handed with their concepting. Yeah, I mean, Coheed and Cambria especially, their, their concepts are a bit too grandiose to really work a lot of the time. I like the idea of what they're doing, but sometimes it's just... It's a bit too much. Really. Yeah, you can't really follow the story properly. It's a shame, really, because they've, they've got some interesting ideas there. Mm. Anyway, I'd say it's definitely... This is one of the cases where I'll get this out of the way so we don't need to discuss it. We've been saying over the past few album reviews that we'd change around the placements of songs. This time around, I'd say all the songs are in the right order. I would agree with that. I mean, the only thing I would say, if we're going to talk about this concept now, is that The Marriage of a Taurus feels like an ending song. That's what it technically is. Yeah. It is, in fact, you know, it was the original song. At the end, the last track after it is actually a bonus track. Yeah. But the Measure of Tires looks pretty bloody well as a final proper track. Yeah. So. I don't actually have the bonus track, so... Oh, then, okay. yeah. I've got it on mine because i got the uh, special edition. Hmm. But, I thought it was like, yeah, yeah, they've got this bonus track, they've got this track before, and yeah, I can just hearing it again earlier on when I was going through it again to refresh my memory. Hmm. The Measure of Tires looks really well as an ending song. Yeah. It, we'll cover it more later, but I think it definitely feels a bit like a sort of, if you like, a marriage to the afterlife. Hmm. Kind of a final, lasting moment, I think. Mm. It's worse as an intro. Yeah. So. But anyway, we'll cover that later. Uh, the Wretched Tide. I mean, I can see what you mean by, you know, feeling like it's going directly off on the previous song, because the opening riff is very, very similar to the main riff in A uh, Hero's Crown. Yeah. Also, there isn't actually a definitive stop between the songs, so... No, it just kind of carries on going into the next mm -hmm. one. Which is something that happens quite often in concept albums, so... Yeah. It's further evidence that it may well be... They have some concept to it. Yeah. Um, what has got the interesting fact of it is the first song on the album, as far as I can remember, anyway, I don't remember being in Heavy Ground. I not Heavy Ground, but uh, it's also got violins. Yeah. Which is something that they have done before, so it's not a new element for them, but... It was very unused in the last album, The Rose of Apocalypse. I think the only the bonus track actually had violins in that album, which is kind of disappointing. But they used quite a few songs here. Mm. This is the first time it's introduced. Which is it's used very sparingly, which is like, some bands tend to just overuse it. In this case, it's used now and then as for good effect. Yeah. I mean, I like the way the violins are used, they feel like um, song lyrics in themselves, if that makes sense. Hmm, I can say that. You haven't got a lyrical content to them. Hmm. Yeah, it's used to a lyrical key. Yeah. <laughs> They're kind of very much used, as I said earlier, they're used sparingly, which is an interesting idea. Yeah. So there are a lot of bands that kind of, oh, we've got violins, let's just use them all the time forever. Mm. I mean... Well, it, I love violins, it can get a bit tiring after a while. Yeah. I mean, I'm a violinist, and I, I can recognise it getting tiring. Yeah. It's, it's one of those, uh, dudes, you're not <laughs> trying to play The Devil Went Down to Georgia. Ease up a bit. Mm. Well, like... The first song is quite a limit on the amount of vocals from here. Here, it's mostly um, the male vocals. I can't remember. I think it's Anders, isn't it? Uh, let me just. It's Anders Johansson. Mm. Something like that. I should know this. Certainly, they're one of my favourite bands. But... <laughs> uh, let me just check. Um... And uh, Anders Jacobson. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but Johansson. Oh, Johansson's surname with the girl number one on Marth. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these... Anders Jacobson. All these Anders. <laughs> and then we've got Wes Anderson. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, he's, he kind of, a lot of the vocals here are kind of him doing kind of usual kind of spoken word kind of vocals, which he does quite a lot, mm -hmm. along with his growling. Yeah. As far as growling vocalists go, he's actually got a very kind of powerful growling, which yeah. I like. If this makes sense, I think the best way to describe his type of growling is clean growling. Well, it's kind of got a kind of gruff tendency to it that has a lot of power, but it also is still understandable. Yeah. Which, once again, this is very similar to Abel and Marth. Mm. And again, we get to what helps drive the album forward. I mean, he's also a songwriter himself, so all the lyrics are done by him, so... Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the way to describe the lyrics is the kind of poetic, I guess? Yeah. Which kind of fits in with the kind of, kind of gothic doom style that they go for a lot with their music. Lots of songs about you know, love and loss and death and you know, the regular kind of stuff you put in doom metal. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when the gothic tint like Draconian. Mm. Uh, 
uh, just looking at the lyrics and the more I read through it the more it feels like this could be a concept album mm. um, again we get to the idea of a king who's dying um, it's things like the wretched tongues wording their pain onto me until even tide enters there's no place out of here mm. Which, uh, if you remember briefly Arcane Wayne fell their second album was a concept album mm-hmm. at least a light a very lightly based concept album Mm-hmm. That's my favourite album of them. It's pretty much a masterpiece. It's one of my favourite albums all the time. So, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, tired and cold, a tale since eons of old. So elusive, this intemperance of escape. Interesting as the booth of, kind of uh, as per perspective from a doom metal. The songs are quite long as well. So I think. I mean, with the exception of the bonus track, every single song is at least six minutes long. <laughs> Strongest being 602, longest being 854. Mm. So, yeah. So, not super long. I mean, not as I say, Morning Belabeth. <laughs> they're uh, naturally about 14 15 minutes per song. Mm. And one of them, Bright Times, got to about 12 13 minutes as well. Yeah. But you couldn't have done that before. The first album had a 12 minute song, and the second album had a 15 minute song. Mm. So, it's not unlike them to go on for longer tracks. Um, It's one of those. That's the key thing that I found with this album is. As the songs progressed, I didn't get the, oh, when's the next song going to be on feeling? I just got the, wait, we're already at the next song? <laughs> That's always a good thing. I mean, if it listen to a song and it kind of thinks, oh, this is going on forever, then you're going to get problems. In this mm. case, it doesn't. It feels right. Yeah. And when you consider that the average length of the songs, let's see... Well, the sh- about six and a half or so. Yeah, average length is six and a half minutes, which... That's not exceptionally long. I certainly listen to a lot longer. I mean, <laughs> Mighty same. Masturbator, that's almost 17 minutes long. Yeah, I mean, Death Come Near Me from their second album is 1522. Yeah, so. but um, it, it's one of those... It's the right length to establish the song and do what it needs to do. Yeah, I mean, the other ones that do go on longer, say uh, Marital Guitaris and uh, Little Linear Star and Dusk Baroner, they're going to also... They develop over time, so they kind of add a bit of extra sections in there, which wouldn't necessarily, you know, have a similar kind of structure as the uh, shorter ones. Yeah. Like the refrain in Dust Mariner uh, as well. No, 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 um, the Neo Star, for example. Mm. Um, let's just say, Hail Tortured Blue. I think this is probably the first song on the album that actually made me realise quite how good a vocalist Heike is. Mm-hmm. Some of the vocals near the end of the song are absolutely gorgeous. Kind of a very ominous start to it as well. Yeah. Kind of, <laughs> and a very open... Uh, yeah. There you go, we're not going to carry on like, going straight into the song like they did the last two. Mm-hmm. Kind of opens up the kind of ambient feel and then goes into a slow riff. I think one of the slower songs again. Mm-hmm. I mean, kind of, the interesting thing about this trend is, if you look at their earlier works, go back to Where Love Was More on their first album, or Arcane Rail, Fame Rail, uh, Arcane Rain Fell, mm-hmm. second album, there's a lot of slower stuff there for the most part, only a couple of songs here and there being a bit faster. Mm-hmm. But then from the third album, Turning Season Within, and then the last one, Refer to Apocalypse, there's going to be a much faster kind of style where with Sovereign I think to split that there are mm. some songs that kind of have more evoked the earlier stuff with a slower heavier kind of marching feel yeah. some of the ones are the ones that are a lot faster and more upbeat I guess. not really upbeat because it's, it's a doom metal band but mm. they're equivalent of upbeat yeah doom metal upbeat doom metal I'm sure something like that exists uh, River and Bazaar is the first thing that comes to mind mm? River and Bazaar probably the first one that comes to mind for second thing not familiar with them. We only heard a few songs, but they're pretty good. Anyway, back to where we were. <laughs> yeah. Um, For Thought of Blue. Yeah. Yeah, so after the main kind of heavy riff comes in, kind of mostly kind of background guitar work and synths, and then just Heike doing vocals, and said so that's the one first point where it's like, these vocals are really good. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of bands that do this kind of thing, with kind of heavy metal backing and a guy growling and a female doing vocals. It's pretty common. Mm. But Dracoonian is probably one of the bands I've seen have done it best. Yeah. Leaves eyes do it quite well as well. Hmm, they do. I remember someone recently saying that Sovereign actually sounds quite a bit like what Within Temptation sound, would have sounded like if they hadn't, you know, dropped the regal on. Mm-hmm. Like, I see the similarities between Shandon Adel and Heike. Mm. Of course, in their first album, Within Temptation, they did use growling vocals there, which are actually pretty good. Their first album were really good. Yeah. But from the second album onwards, they lost the growling vocals and it which went to Shandon Nadal herself. That was it. Uh, so the first time was a lot slower as well. It was a lot closer to you know, the regular doom metal structure. It's mm. interesting seeing what they've become. Yeah. <laughs> um, just, again, looking through 
the more I looked through the lyrics, I mean, obviously hearing them and then properly reading through them quite different things, but it feels like the more I read through, the more it reinforces the ideas of it being a very particular concept album. Like, um, there's a fallen statue in the wilderness. It has found its way to your dreams, haunting the waking hours in night's colour with eyes like rain. Mm. It's so interesting progression I noticed actually when I listened to it earlier. In fact, it does that line and then comes up later saying something about, I will read the statue for you. And it's like, yeah, that's progression, right? Mm. Everybody was saying, you're kind of just completely switching up the final topic. It's like, oh, yeah, this is the kind of situation we're in now. I'm going to do my best to make it better. Mm. Which, once again, fills in with the kind of topic with anything I heard. Yeah. So it is interesting. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm struggling under all this weight, but I'm going to make it better if I can. Um, I'm just going through. Uh, it's also the lyrics about love here. Yeah. So it's, it's a very typical Draconian theme. Mm. <laughs> Just about the, it's the purest love of all, kind of thing. Mm. It feels like he's kind of gone through a love and loss, kind of thing, yeah. yeah. Possibly, I don't know, if there's the kind of concept here of there being a king, maybe he did something that caused his wife to get killed or something. Maybe. Which is, yeah, that sounds like a Gothic Doom kind of theme right there. Yeah. That's I mean, you must think of um, A Line of Deathless Kings, album by Madame Bride. It's mm. really much that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, stellar Tombs. Well, after the last song being, you know, kind of very slow, this just kind of kicks it into fast pace right at the start. Yeah. <laughs> you know, full out with the heaviness. And love this opening. It's great. Mm. I'm just trying to think through it. Um. Um, some of the songs, the faster ones, I think you remind me a little bit of Insomnium. Ah. It's uh, yeah. kind of the kind of heavy riffage from the growling. I can see that. Yeah. I mean, you didn't really think that you know, a doom metal band would remind you of some like Insomnium, which are very much mellow death, <laughs> but... I'm just, I'm a huge fan of Antonium, so I'm okay with this. Yeah. Uh, just do a quick recheck of Stellar Tombs because my brain is addled like all fuck. <laughs> Back live. Yeah. Um, yeah, just had to rejog my memory. It's sort of like, I know <laughs> I like this, but I can't remember quite. Um, what exactly what it was you liked. <laughs> yeah. But it's, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> What I'd say it reminds me of. There's a few bands that it definitely reminds me of, though. It's certainly one of the heavier songs on the album. On the other hand, there's one bit later on where it kind of just goes into Anders doing kind of spoken word vocals with Heike doing kind of scat kind of ah, in the background. It sounds mm. beautiful. It's like, because it's kind of Draconian kind of embody the kind of entire kind of, I see King the kind of, but hey. Yeah. <laughs> the kind of structure of having kind of the brutal side of things combined with the kind of fragility of the female vocals. Mm. They seem to know exactly how to do it. Yeah. They've only built it up over the years they've been around. They've been around, got them ages. Is this like I mean, the seventh album or something? Uh, it's the sixth full album, I think. Plus, I had one album which is a bunch of, essentially a bunch of uh, B sides and stuff that I put together. Because mm. uh, Wither was Mourn, Arcane Rain Fell, Turning Season Within, then Burning Halo, I think, was next. That's the one that's got all the old kind of demo songs that have been upgraded and rewritten for that album. Mm hmm. Wizard Apocalypse and their software into sixth album. Fair dues. They had a bunch of like uh, EPs before that. A bit around 21 years, so yeah. Mm. Quite a back catalogue. <laughs> um, like a lot of bands, they seem to have been continuously evolving the sound over the time and haven't gotten stale yet, which is quite impressive. Yeah. I mean, some bands, well, a key one where it's sort of like they've definitely not evolved is ACDC. <laughs> I mean, their most recent album is sort of like, I. It sounds like it's from the 80s. <laughs> and what I mean by that is it sounds like they released it in the 80s and they've just re-released it. Mm, it's sad, really. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It, that's why it's so frustrating when I find fans complaining about changes to sound and things like that. It's sort of like, well... It's probably worse if it just stagnates. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, complaints about... I, I, I'm pretty sure there were complaints when Metallica was taking things in new directions from their self-titled album onwards. Hmm. It's a kind of solid, pure thrash straight into more kind of regular heavy metal. Yeah. And it's a bit of thrash elements, of course, but hmm. then they lost those eventually as well, so... Yeah. Well, I imagine a lot of Metallica fans didn't particularly care for the Black Album, so it being incredibly popular, because it's quite a bit different to everything before that. Yeah. Um, sorry, brain fart. It, it, kind of it needs a certain hmm. level of things. It need not just you know to carry on doing what you do good but also mm. add a few elements here and there that also make it fresh yeah sometimes it's going to go completely in the wrong direction and end up something like garbage <laughs> that's an anger but 
I don't know, just, other bands just produce the same album over and over again for like 20 years. Mm-hmm. The thing is... The problem I do actually have is uh, with some uh, recent Iron Maiden stuff, they have a problem of doing that occasionally. Yeah. The they thing... do mix it up enough, I okay, most of the time, but some stuff does sound very familiar to some old stuff. Yeah. The thing is, as much as we bash on Saint Anger, we can say one thing for it that's positive. At least they were experimenting and trying something different. It's true, and they've experimented in different directions since. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather a band experiment and fail than never try anything new at all, and we end up with ACDC. <laughs> all we're going to do with that, actually, is 34 point something, some obnoxious number, percent complete by uh, My Dying Bird. Mm-hmm. That very much was an experimental album. Yeah. It kind of took the, sort of the radio, the doom metal style stuff, there's a couple of songs on there, like the first track, uh, The Whole Fucking Mother, and one of the bonus tracks, and yeah, regular My Dying Bird stuff. Mm. And then you have other stuff like Heroin Chic, which is kind of it's a little bit like new metal combined with trip hop. It's really odd. Mm-hmm. A lot of people hate it, but there's only some genuinely really good stuff on there, and it's a lot different to their regular stuff. And when they tell you this, it was kind of a failed experiment, I guess. But on the other hand, at least they actually bothered to do it. Yeah. And there's some genuinely good stuff on there. I think it gets a bit too much hate compared to what it actually deserves, even if some of it isn't that good. Mm. Which album? Uh, I don't know the exact title, it's, you know, it's 34 point something percent complete. All right. 34.788%. It's a very interesting album, even if it isn't necessarily what people were expecting. Anyway, where were we with the actual album? Were we? Uh, um, well, Stellar Tombs. Um, uh, no Linear Star. Uh, I absolutely love this song. <laughs> yeah, when we were mentioning it before we start recording, that you really enjoyed the song. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the refrain on it is absolutely amazing. It is pretty damn good. Mm. Well, this is kind of the point where the album starts going from being really good to being really, really good. Yeah. I think the second half of the album is the stronger half, and the first half's really good anyway. So. Yeah. It, it's basically, it's one of those, the first half of the album, that would set it in four-star category. The second half, that's when it starts to push things into five-star, I think. Hmm. I mean, starting from this song onwards, it tends to, I think it actually does improve on a very solid start. Yeah. It was also the first point where songs start getting a bit longer. Yeah. Because the first four all in the 60 minute category, and this goes to nearly 8 minutes, followed by another 8 minutes. A couple of shorter ones, and back to eight, nearly 9 minutes for the last song. Um, so, yeah. Let's see. Um, almost 8 minutes, 8 minutes, uh, 6 and a half, 6 and 3 quarters, <laughs> 9 minutes. Yeah. Lynching the bonus strikes only 4. But. <laughs> No point me talking about the bonus track seeing as I don't have it. I would recommend getting it. It is actually a pretty dang good song. It's just got one of the actual only proper guitar solos in the album. Huh. There's only a little mini solos here and there. But. That's in- You just made a very good point. I don't. I've actually realised there aren't really any guitar solos. There's a couple of little bits here and there, but not like full on proper guitar solos. Yeah. I think it might be in Dusk Mariner. There's kind of like a really, really slow one. <laughs> followed strictly by some heavy vocals, which are gorgeous. There's, as far as some of those go, it's relatively uh, held back on that, which is not entirely uncommon for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, Doom Metal in general isn't that heavy on soloing for the most part. Mm. Anyone I can think of does it a lot of guitar solos. It's Morning Beloved. They like doing the guitar solos in their songs. But then again, when you're songs to average length of about 13 minutes, you have to get time to do so. Yeah. Yeah, no lonelier star. Again, we get to sort of a ruler looking back on his time. That sort of, I rise through debris and the dust. Who is this sun? I always spoke to the stars. I rise through debris and the dust. Who was the sun? I always spoke to the stars. <laughs> Which kind of like, sounds like he's kind of lost all hope. And he's just trying to talk to the gods or whatever because yeah. nothing else can save him. Very much kind of desperate as style for the vocals. Or for the lyrics to people. I would actually do wonder whether there actually is a proper solid concept here or whether it's just you know, left for interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's kind of the strength of the album, really, that a lot of it is left up to interpretation. We can just take it as, you know, a metal album, or you can think about it and think, oh, okay, there actually is some kind of story being told here. Hmm. Because of how intricate the lyrics are and everything like that, I feel it needs to be viewed as more than just a metal album. Hmm. That's kind of one that I think people that don't necessarily like that much metal could probably still enjoy. Yeah. Obviously it's got the problem of, you know, having crowd vocals which some people just can't get into. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, we know for a fact that Richard isn't really into that side of metal. No. We reckon, you know, people that are, even if they don't really like that kind of vocals, even if, if they can appreciate the fact that they actually do, you know, have a, a reason to be there, mm. then maybe it could work. Yeah. Especially with Hickey's vocals as well, the adding of the dress position there. Mm. It is Hickey. <laughs> you say freaking Hey Dude. I think it's because that's a more common name. It is, yeah. Oh, just a sec. Um, which is actually what it is. <laughs> uh, the sound decided to go a bit weird there. Uh-huh. Technical difficulties. <laughs> oh god, now I've just... You know that um, in The Simpsons, the guy at the camera holding a bottle <laughs> and it's got technical difficulties. Yeah. We'll just say when we're back. So. Uh, sorry? Are we back yet? Y- yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, waiting for you back, but we're actually already back. <laughs> Um, yeah, you were saying? Um, yeah, uh, I'm brain fart <laughs> now. <laughs> well, you were talking about um, No Lonelier Star. <laughs> yeah, well, I just think No Lonelier Star is, it kind of evokes the whole idea of a king who's sort of... Lost lo- everything. Yeah, <laughs> lost everything, the loneliness that has been propagated as a consequence of him being a ruler, that sort of thing. And mm. it all just, it's very effective in just kind of creating a landscape in a way. Mm. I suppose it's kind of, you know, being given exposition in a story. <laughs> yeah. And I think up to this point, it's been kind of explaining and showing, you know, all the things that have been happening mm. in this content. And this point, it's kind of, you know, at one point, we're getting to flashback episode and just shows the backstory. Yeah. Of how he's been feeling throughout the story. Mm. Um, There's concepts. Yeah. And then we've got Dusk Mariner, which I think flows on perfectly from it. Mm, and I absolutely love Lost Mariner. In one of my favorite song on the album. It's such a good song. Mm. I think the vocals here, well, the lyrics, once again, kind of follows it. I mean, it opens up, just no light finds me, perish like the setting sun, no truth defies me, unlike, and burden like the fallen one. Mm. <laughs> I give you my love, but it's freezing cold. Just those <laughs> opening lyrics really... It's hard... It's hard <laughs> to really pin down. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know that Interesting about Dust Mariner is it does remind me a lot of their kind of first couple of albums. Mm-hmm. A very slow, kind of heavy, methodical drumming and guitaring. It kind of, it probably out of all the songs now, it reminds me, it's the one that reminds me most of the Arkham okay, Rainfell, especially. Mm-hmm. It reason to Dust Mariner and then something like, say, well, probably Scenery of Loss, or maybe, um, written Daylight like Misery, actually, because they're a bit faster. Mm-hmm. A bit with a more vocals and hair Because what I have noticed is that they've got a lot more female vocals in this album compared to any other one. Yeah. I know someone was saying a while ago that they thought that when they had Lisa there, even though her vocals were amazing, they didn't really utilise as much as they could have done. I think maybe they're taking that on heart for this album and actually used Hake a lot. It doesn't feel like it's used too much though. I mean, we're a good balance between Hake and Anders. It's supposed to be a very hard kind of balance to get. Yeah. I think what makes the balance is it's not just how frequent the female to male vocals are. It's also the timing of them. Mm. You know? very much, it's very methodical as to you know, where exactly everything's been placed. Mm. There's a certain structure they've managed to get here, thinking, okay, this needs to be in this one to make it sound the best it possibly can, and they do it from a damn point. Yeah, and... Oh. I suppose it's probably Anders' job, because he's a songwriter. <laughs> I mean, I presume that the other band members would have influence. Oh yeah, I would have thought they would. Yeah. In the pretty case, if he writes a song, then he gets everyone's opinion on it. Mm. A lot of bands work that way. They have a song as writes a song, and he goes, "Okay, guys, what do you think of this?" Yeah. It's very. The thing about it does matter is there's a lot of it which is very, very kind of minimalist. Mm-hmm. A lot of times where this is very slow, very kind of calm, just with um, KK doing kind of very fragile vocals over the top. Yeah. It sounds amazing. And then just by you know, gets a bit heavier when Anders comes in to those growling parts. Yeah. And it kind of... Just trying to think of a good way of wording things. Because um, the difference in the vocals also helps as a sort of... Kind of a contrast in personalities. Hmm. And so it's having both the male and female vocals could also work in a kind of character basis if you're working on a concept. Yeah. So, kind of, if you only have one vocalist... There's only so much you can actually technically do. Mm. But if you do have you know, more than one, then maybe you know, you kind of 
if you're trying to create a closet album, it gives you more availability to do stuff. I mean, this kind of the kind of structure we're talking about here, it does make me think a lot of you know, is the king and is or well, possibly just a dead wife, depending on what kind of context is going on. Yeah, it would be nice if they could release some sort of details as to what exactly is going on. I mean, we're just spitballing here. Yeah, well, maybe this is the entire point. It's mm. supposed to be like this, and there's an say, okay, and we've done this because we want you to have your own opinions on it. Yeah. And I said, which is earlier, it's a nice thing to do because you know, it gets people talking about it. It's like, yeah, we've been talking about this content for bloody ages. Yeah. A lot of albums is like, okay, it sounds good. What else is it to it? <laughs> <laughs> this case, it's actually looking more in depth at it, and I think that actually helps us kind of enjoy it more. Yeah. I mean, as I said earlier, it's kind of command that also the more you listen to it, the more things you pick up on. Yeah. It's definitely an album that, first listen, you get an appreciation for it but you don't get the in-depth details and how it exactly makes you feel mm. subsequent listens you really get it it starts to evoke certain emotions more effectively mm. and i think it's an album that demands being listened to more than once more than mm. once in even one sitting i mean just well, I multiple times already to... yeah just before the show, I listened to it three times. <laughs> well, the Dust Mountain is one of the songs it does only ha- actually have a guitar set on it. Yeah. So, well, I suppose once again, it's one of the longer songs, it gives them more time to do what they want to do. Mm. But it has that one point, probably about five minutes in, where it just drops out almost completely, it has AK's vocals, then comes on kind of a, a much kind of faster, more driving kind of drum beat to it, and then the other part of the song. Mm-hmm. Take it because on top of that, goes in the guitar solo, and just suddenly just stops for a half a second. To go straight into a heavy part with and, and just growling. It says, Yes! <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted from this. Yeah. And one thing it probably reminds me most of is Earthbound from Telling Season Within, the third album, which is also eight minutes long. Mm-hmm. But they kind of had a lot of kind of heavy, much faster, but kind of heavy growl vocals. They kind of bit in the middle, which kind of goes to Bruce Anders and Lisa mm-hmm. just doing vocals together in the sense. It makes you think of that a bit, and it kind of has got the kind of opening and closing bits being quite similar behind the bit in the middle, which is a lot different. Uh, Probably there's a technical term for that, but I can't think of it right now. Um, <laughs> so it's not really refrain, because it's a lot longer. Mm. Um, oh, there is a particular term for it, but it's gone right out of my head. <laughs> you know, that it's sort of like, right in your head, and then... <laughs> also, just you're looking at the vocal, uh, lyrics here, just breathe carelessly, be all that you fear as a child, see it's only me and not the heavens coming down on you. Mm. It's like the idea that this king is kind of pissed off about everything that's happened to him, and now he's getting angry. <laughs> <laughs> also, felt the last lyric entirely in Dust Mouth just farewell. Mm. <laughs> Meaning he's becoming someone different. Um, Dishearten. Dishearten is possibly my second favourite on the album. For me. Missing is good, I'm amazing. Yeah. For me, Dishearten is my favourite. It's just a really, really good song. Mm. Wait, so I think when I listened to it the first time through, I had the same kind of thing as you, and I think Dust Mountain was the first one that really stood out to me. Mm. And if you have that followed directly with this album, it's like, yes, this is bloody amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Those two together just work really nicely. Yeah. Um, just looking through the lyrics again. Uh, Disheartened and cold, and scars upon my soul. I lost you in silence, bleeding through the walls, a sorrow game that ceased to leave, and took you from my arms. <laughs> So this actually reinforces your theory about loss of uh, the king's wife. Hmm. Maybe well, that is the thing. I mean, it sounds like looking at the lyrics, it is very much not a very happy song. It sounds like the king just lost it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, further I linger with nothing to give. Faster I'm choking on the poison I breathe. Spare me your judgment and spare me your woes. This burden upon me is ruthless and cold. It's kind of, what's interesting about this song, it doesn't actually sound that much like any other song they've done, I think. Mm. It's got a certain kind of different beat to it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Which doesn't make me think of recording. I can't remember who it makes you think of. When I work out like that. Um, hmm. As I said before, I get the feeling of a lot of different bands in this album. I'm sure it's kind of shows it's a varied album, really. A lot of songs do sound quite a bit different to others. Mm-hmm. It was like, you know, the first couple that sound quite similar. That's probably intentional, because some of the later stuff sounds a lot different to other stuff. Just often doesn't sound like a typical Draconian song to me, but it does sound bloody amazing, so <laughs> I can't really complain about that. I mean, I suppose Dishotten does probably make me think the most of their last album, mm-hmm. but better. I mean, the last album was 
pretty damn good. But I think it's probably their weakest of the lot. I think a lot of songs sound quite similar there. Yeah. Kind of the problem with a little bit too samey. So well, not to I don't know, not Chris Level or anything, but kind of if you listen to one song just out of nowhere, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell immediately which one was which. Mm-hmm. So it's got slight um ah oh, pylon. Mm. It's good stuff, but there's no not that much variation in the songs as compared to pretty much every other album they've done. Mm-hmm. Every other one has a kind of variety. It's not like a signature kind of Dracoonian sound to it, but has enough variety to make it interesting as a stand-by-stand song, as well as also having it work together as a collective. But if you listen to, say, Disheartened, then compare it to something like the next song after this, it's then completely different. Also, they don't have the same kind of style. Also, it's interesting... I don't think it's been actually used that many times before now. Whether there was some part of Disheartened where it ended up with actually having Anders growled vocals and Higgy's vocals actually kind of harmonising in a little way. It's yeah. really odd. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> There's certain points where it's this very otherworldly feeling to it. It's like, actually, does somehow kind of harmonise with growls with vocals. It's like, huh? Yeah. How did you do that? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I've seen it done, but it's still quite impressive. Yeah, it's not exactly something that happens often. Mm. Um, next, there's uh, Rivers Between Us. This, um, this song stands out a lot, simply because it has Anders actually doing vocals. Yeah. Like regular vocals for most of it. It's probably led by him, actually. Mm-hmm. So all the stuff before has been uh, Heike doing female vocals and Anders growling, the occasional spoken words. Nope. Rivers Between Us is probably at least half of it is just Anders actually singing properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a nice change up, especially when you think of it. It's kind of, kind of ballady, I guess. Yeah. In kind of doom metal way, which is odd, but I like it. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting for the fact that it features someone called Daniel Angheed. Oh, was it him doing vocals? It might be, actually. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't like to say. Um... Well, the thing I don't think, can't think of actually many times, I might be completely wrong, but I can't think of down to where Anders actually done regular vocals, so it might be uh, him doing it. Uh, I... I'm not familiar with the guy, so... Neither am I. I think it doesn't sound particularly familiar. Uh, Crippled Black Phoenix. Don't know the band. No. They're a, ba- they're a rock group from the United Kingdom. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. He is a vocalist, so it's quite possible. Hmm. Uh, just like it might be, yeah. Uh, really explain it. That, you know, I don't think I've done this kind of thing entirely before, so it's probably possible going to get vocalist specifically for this song. But yeah, it pretty much is, you know, the closest equivalent to a doom metal power ballad. Yeah. <laughs> Which is an odd phrase in itself. Well, it's a contradiction in terms, for one. <laughs> but it's the only power ballad that I'd ever listened to, because god damn, I hate power ballads. <laughs> Basically, power metal is taking the ballad part out. <laughs> yeah, this is true. And giving it some balls. Even if you sound like you don't have any, because you're singing so high. Yeah, there's a regular power metal like that. Yeah. Well, um, I think the, one thing that stands about this is a bit right near the, uh, well, the second half, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, like, uh, let me take the noose from our necks and carry us home, still so alive even after you die, transcending with time. We're just two cripples who fail to belong. Yes, we are two cripples, but we need to hold on. That <laughs> that bit really sticks out for me. And a bit after that, we're just, hey, okay, just going, wake me slowly if ever at all, wake me slowly and watch me fall. Mm. Her vocals there are lovely. Yeah. I mean, this kind of brings back the whole idea of lovers who've been separated. Mm. I mean, well, we're in total alone. Rivers Between Us sounds like that kind of thing to me. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it may well be by death, anyway. Yeah. Rivers Alive still so alive even after you die transcending with time. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you've got this spoken part, drift like a cloud and flow like water, seeing that all life is a magnificent illusion, a plane of energy, and that there is absolutely nothing fundamentally to be afraid of. Fundamentally. You will be afraid on the surface. You will be afraid of putting your hand in the fire. You will be afraid of getting sick. But you Mm. will not be afraid of fear. Fear will pass over your mind like a black cloud will be reflected in the mirror. Someone's been watching Dune. (laughs) Well, it's not the first time I've had unspoken passages like that. I mean, if you go back to Arcane Rain Fell, a one-track expostulation, literally it's just one giant monologue. There's nothing else to it, really. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So like, here I have this album, the seven tracks and one monologue. It's kind of cheesy in its own way, but also kind of cool. But yeah, so if you compare it to the previous track, it is a lot different. Mm. It's kind of further expands upon the variety of the album. But guess, even though it is essentially, you know, a ballad, it still doesn't feel like nearly seven minutes long. Yeah. Again, we get to how to craft songs well. If it 
seven minutes or eight minutes or even 15 or 17 or 21 minutes or whatever you still feel like you're at the first second mm. you know it's all you have the feeling of oh but i want more <laughs> it's gonna kind of you know if a song doesn't feel like it's too long despite being really quite long then mm. it's probably a very good song yeah i mean go to my wheelhouse of what I'm the massive fanboy of Deep Peace and Bastard by Devin Townsend those two is sort of well Bastard especially when I looked at the timestamp I was sort of like wait that was 10 minutes <laughs> but to be fair, if you look at my favourite songs of all time list it includes Death Come Near Me by Draconian which is 15 minutes and it includes Initial Dive Power Companion by Agalog which is 14 minutes yeah. so yeah not a likely problem with long, uh, long songs also, you know, as I said before, uh, My Southern Sulcus by uh, Morning Beloved mm-hmm. has five tra- uh, six tracks, four, five of them are at least four minutes long, and most of them are bloody amazing. <laughs> also being a fan of Cold Luna, yeah, they have a lot of long ones as well. And if I actually don't see them, well, I'm guessing they've got tickets, but they will mm. be playing Dust to Dead Band, which is also 15 minutes long. Yeah. And seeing that live last time was possibly the best song I've ever actually experienced live. I think it was absolutely amazing. <laughs> I think it does remind me of actually is uh, Little Stania. It's a particular song mm-hmm. in that. So I just didn't watch Stania really. Mm-hmm. We only heard a couple of other albums. I mean, I knew after well, the main people behind it left after uh, the fourth album, I think it was. They haven't been particularly good since, from my experience. But the stuff before that is generally really good. So, as you said earlier, there's a lot of bands that this album kind of reminds you of. Mm. I mean, some bits remind me of um, Paradise Lost quite dramatically. So. Mm. Especially earlier albums. Mm. But I've got a lot of things. I mean, do you have things that make you think of, say, Tristania and Paradise Lost and My Dying Bride and Insomnium all in the same album? It's quite varied. Yeah. Uh, I mean, also, Rivers Between actually finishes with Guitar Salute. It's like only the second one in the entire album, really. <laughs> second pop one, anyway. Yeah. But this so, is one of those times where they actually make the lack of solos work. Mm. I mean, some bands do that. They're like, oh, every single song needs to have like three solos. Mm. Like, Not really. Of course. Metallica, that's why St. Anger didn't work, because it didn't have any solos. It didn't have any solos, and there were songs that were like eight minutes long and repeated themselves quite a Yeah. Yeah, no, back to the last song. Yeah. Marriage of Guitarus. This was a perfect capstone to the album. It is. This is the longest song on the album, mm. which is not unlike them. I thought the first time I had a longer song as a finale. As I said earlier, Death Come Near Me being 15 minutes long is not only the longest song on that album, and the last song is also the longest song they've done, I think. <laughs> so. Um, but it just. It's one of those. I suppose you could get to. Um, oh, hmm? just going through the lyrics. Um, this is a beautiful place. Here Cassiel wedded winter. So man could grieve, so man could see. These trees are dark and old. In solitude unified, licking the ground, tasting the rough, cold wind so man could breathe. Hmm. It, it's one of those... This is going to sound like a bit of a contradiction in terms, <laughs> but the marriage of a Taurus could be described as being almost boringly perfect in how difficult it is to describe. <laughs> this is definitely a contradiction of terms, though. <laughs> Well, by that I mean it's so exquisite in its composition, the vocals, everything about it, that it's so very difficult to pin down just what exactly makes it a great song. Hmm. I think it's kind of thing, it, it fits as an ending and a conclusion to everything. Mm. I, mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the strongest song on the album, although it is also really good, mm. but it just is placed perfectly. Yeah. We should stand out even more. Yeah. I mean, as I said earlier, it kind of feels like a marriage into the afterlife. The lyrics are kind of nondescript. Mm. I'm not entirely sure what they're referring to here. Yeah, I mean, these wastelands of dusk, oceans bled and barren, lament of life, a long, a love song, the only death awoken, a fear transcendence keeps us from the rapture of one. <laughs> yeah, the lyrics are very nondescript. It's like, what are you on about? <laughs> Uh, but musically it feels like sort of a marriage into the afterlife or something like that it's just kind of like you know, everything ending mm. it's kind of like some kind of apocalyptic feel to it Yeah. things falling apart and collapsing which is appropriate for a last song yeah um, Yeah. I, 
as I say, I'm kind of dried up for how to really describe things. Well, this film in particular seems to be quite hard to describe. <coughs> is once again, it seems very much like a kind of half back to the earlier albums where you know, things were very, very slow. Mm. Kind of, it's very much less like you know, the kind of gothic doom <coughs> that people usually do, and more like actual funeral doom. Yeah. There's no points anyway. Some parts of it are very, very slow. Of course, you know, being slow is not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you like doom metal. Because doom metal in general is quite slow for a good part of it. Especially if you go to funeral doom. Mm-hmm. So, oh well, there's more than three guitarists per minute. Too fast. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think we can kind of wrap it up for the album. Yeah, as I said earlier, at the start of the album, the way this works so well as an ending song, it's just those last lyrics and here go. Yeah. Just the last bit of so tired, so tired, I need to feel the freezing blue, leave me here, let the coming of spring carry me back to earth, leave me here. Mm. Just he get on vocals, nothing else. It's... Holding. To... Yeah. <laughs> and it needs that to really just... It's one of those how do you end an album right? And that's how you do it. Yeah. The thing is, is that entire like kind of final part actually starts up like three minutes from the end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of weird. It starts so early on because I mean, it is just the final part of it. Actually, mm. it slows down a hell of a lot there as well. Mm. <laughs> kind of, it's just kind of emphasises further the kind of feeling of you know things just collapsing and falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we can. Wrap... The guitar side about there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we can start wrapping it up for this album. Indeed. Oh, I'll just have a quick word about the uh, bonus track since I can. Yeah. Um, it's called uh, With Love and Defiance. It's pretty good. It's actually really quite weird because it's also only it's less than four and a half minutes, so it's a lot shorter than anything else in the album. I mean, I can see why it's a bonus track, I guess. Not necessarily because it's bad, but because of its placement. Because so the Marriage of the Taurus pretty much is the perfect song to end on, so having it after is kind of. It's a bit jarring. Like, yeah. The same kind of way that the last song on Cut of Luna's Vertical, the bonus track on that, does not work because the track before that is a perfect ending, and so the bonus track, which sounds not in place. <laughs> And then there's just one of the songs that does actually have a very good guitar solo in it for once. Mm. Well, I suppose if the murder of Atara is kind of like the ending of everything collapsing and falling apart, I suppose with Love and Defiance, if it carried on with the same concept, could actually kind of be the rebirth. I mean, the last lines of it are, they see us weeping the newborn horizon, they are here in spirit and flesh, Love and Defiance. <laughs> a week in a slumbering world, a structure's outside cave in heart, so harbour our sweet sorrow, this lonely exquisite hollow. It doesn't just kind of sound like the bonus track actually fits in with the themes. Mm. Well, the Marriage of Atari is everything kind of just collapsing and falling apart, and then the final bonus track actually is just kind of them fighting back and going, no, despite everything that's happened, we're going to carry on. These... So obviously it kind of breaks the entire concept, mm. or changes it at least. It's a bit like the special edition version of Godspeed on Devil's Thunder, the um, Cradle of Filth concept album about Jules Duray. They've got some bonus tracks that feel like they would perfectly fit in with the rest of the concept album, like uh, Balsamic and Anathema especially. It's sort of like, why isn't this just part of the main album? Mm. It's kind of interesting, it, the con- I mean the bonus track seems to conceptually fit. <laughs> I mean, being a bonus track you wouldn't think it would. Maybe they just thought, oh I wish I put this on here. And then thought, mm, I'm not so sure. Let's put it on there for the bonus track anyway, just in case. I don't want to waste it. But mm-hmm. it. Turns out actually it still kind of works. Yeah. 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 Um, it is pretty damn good. Mm. I'd say if you're a metal fan, definitely pick this up. And if you're wanting to get into the heavier side of metal, it's definitely a good jumping off point because it's one of those things where it's not too heavy, but it's heavier than normal, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's heavier than some metal, but not as heavy as other metal. Mm. Basically, kind of with you know, the switching between the girl vocals and the regular female vocals, yeah. kind of adds a softening blow to it, I guess. If you're yeah. you know, not a fan of constantly having people growl at you. <laughs> also, the fact that you know it's intricately written and there's a lot of concepts, apparently, that we found there. <laughs> but yeah, okay, you could probably enjoy it. I mean, I would say if you're a fan of you know, earlier Draconia Downs, it is very much a worthy follow up. Mm. And Heck is very much a worthy follow through from Lisa. Yeah. I do still miss Lisa's vocals because they're amazing, but. Hickey is a pretty damn good choice to go and follow up. Is there a specific reason Lisa left, or just...? There was a reason, I can't remember exactly what it was now. Yeah. I think she just wanted to know, actually do something else. Fair days. I don't think there's any particular, like, I don't think there's any bad blood or anything there, I think she just wanted to have a changing career. Yeah. Hopefully not, because if there's no bad blood, then there's every chance that she could do guest verses, and you could have Lisa and Hickey duetting or something. 
The idea of those two harmonising would be amazing. <laughs> I want it. It would never happen, but I want it anyway. Uh, I wouldn't say never, I mean, early days yet. This is true. I think it was Lisa left in 2012, I think it was. Mm-hmm. So it's quite a while ago. This is the first album they've had since then, so it's taken a while to get used to it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good album. If you like bands such as, say, Paradise Lost, especially earlier, Paradise Lost, mm. it's that like Entrapment era. Yeah. Entrapment, Entrapment's a song. Draconian Times era, even. Yeah, I was thinking, hang on. <laughs> this is Entrapment's a song I like most on that album. But, mm. Yeah, so if you like Draconian Times, then maybe you like Draconian. <laughs> kind of fits. Or, you know, well, a lot of things, really. A lot of kind of metal. If you really do metal as a genre as a whole, if you like probably gothic metal as a genre as a whole, you probably find something you're interested in. If you like My Dying Pride, you may well like this. Um, they're a pretty big fan of both. Yeah, not so much, but... Yeah. Mm. I've just not been able to get into them, really. Yeah, yeah I haven't. You've got a lot of different stuff there. So. I should actually get that new album, but it's pretty good. I haven't got it yet. Uh, but generally, if you like doom metal or gothic metal or doom gothic slash doom slash death metal, then maybe give this a shot. Mm. You'll probably like it. Know, if you are a Draconian fan, this is definitely a worth listening to. It was kind of a slight return to form after the last album, even though the last album was still pretty good. It was just not as good as other albums. Indeed. There's a lot more variety here compared to the last album, which I think was a little bit samey. Mm. It kind of has a lot of different... Well, some songs are faster or slower than others, songs are different kind of structures to them, and generally it's just all around pretty damn great. Yeah. I know we've been doing it in the past, but I'd say we've kind of outgrown the giving firm star ratings to albums. I think it's just easier for us to say... It's really good. It's a really good album, and definitely give it a go. If you're really into star rating, it's loneliest. It's the loneliest star. Yes. But anyway, yeah, definitely give it a look-see. Uh, well, hear-see. <laughs> Not hear-say, that's a terrible band. <laughs> oh god, I was taken back to my childhood for a moment there. Ugh. But yeah, definitely give it a shot. Yeah, anyway, um, no idea what will be next, because no idea what the upcoming releases are I need to have a look through. Um, it might be a case that next episode is the threatened review of Nickelback's B-sides, <laughs> because I was able to find them, and they have... Well, you'll find out my opinions next time, if we do that. <laughs> Suffice to say, I'm kind of worried. Yeah, but it's something we might have to do. Because mm. we're just a masochist at the same time. Yeah. So if we have to suffer through it, so will you. <laughs> As pretty much like um, this one show where the tagline is If I have to hurt, so does everybody else That's pretty edgy there okay. So yeah, we kind of just petered off into talking about things We're not even sure what we're talking about anymore yeah. That just sounds kind of like a lot of our stuff Yeah, like pretty Even much. during the middle of reviews mm. but. Anyway, as I say, no idea what the next episode will be about Or when it'll be Well, actually It'll be in the past Actually, might as well have the next episode be the year-end review. Well, it is near the year-end, so that kind of makes sense. Yeah, and by the time I've finished editing, it'll be closer to it. Oh, Jesus. It's going to be an interesting next few days, because I've got to do freelance work tomorrow. <laughs> so it's going to be a... Ah! I need to do this for actual money! Ah! I need to do this for potential money! <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. You have fun with it. <laughs> well, I will, because I'll be seeing people I actually like. Yeah, that's always good. Anyway, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me.